Hello, I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. My guest today is Dr. Ted McDonald, Director of the New Brunswick Institute for Research, Data and Training at the University of New Brunswick. He's an important resource for our province right now when it comes to better understanding COVID-19. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. McDonald. Oh, my pleasure. Before we get started talking about COVID-19, can you tell me a little bit about your academic background and how you got involved in data research, specifically when it comes to focusing on health? So I'm a, a professor of economics. Um, I studied, I'm from Nova Scotia, but I uh, trained at the University of Melbourne. And my first job was University of Tasmania. I was a labor economist there, but started to get interested in um, issues around population health and uh, chronic disease. And then when I took the job at UMB uh, 2001, um, I was just a regular researcher. I was always focused on using data, whatever data were available and, and what, did, what can data tell us? So I wasn't a theorist, um, but in the course of working, um, I became more connected with different people in the province, uh, around the, especially the Department of Health. And that's where the idea for the, our institute, MBIRDT was born, uh, Don Ferguson, long retired from government, but he was the deputy minister of health at the time. And he said uh, he had been to Manitoba or he'd sent a team to Manitoba and they had heard about the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and came back and said, let's do that. Um, and so we started talking about what that might look like. I got some funding. He then retired. Um, but we the idea really carried on. And so it became a, a real partnership between the province, Department of Health, Executive Council Office and, and UNB. Uh, although it was always intended to be a resource for all of all of the province and it is and so um, five years of planning and and sorting out legislation and privacy and ethics um, gave and then we we launched the NBRDT uh, in 2015 it's a secure data platform so we host confidential data uh, prepared so we don't see names or addresses but we use that for research so that has really been the engine for the real change in focus for me to kind of full-time health research um, I've always been interested in it, but now we, with the data that we have from the province, um, we're able to do a lot more sort of work that's directly relevant to the New Brunswick situation. And that's what I find kind of most fulfilling to see that our research is uh, making a difference in a, in a tangible way. What would an example be outside of COVID-19 and how data infrastructure can help shape a landscape of a province health-wise? So um, it's, so we, as a, as a research data center, we, we have files, uh, we have data from uh, on New Brunswick individuals, but prepared and it's on, it's a very secure facility. So it's physically secure, I, IT secure, there's policies, procedures, and, and all kinds of things to protect confidentiality and uh, privacy. But we have hospital records, physician billing, cancer screening, um, um, can, the cancer registry, vital statistics, um, we have clinical data from the regional health authorities, so things that are relevant to chronic disease, such as HbA1c, which is blood sugar. So how are people managing diabetes? We have spirometry testing, um, which is used to, um, to, identify, to diagnose uh, people with COPD or the severity of COPD. So New Brunswick has significant burdens of chronic disease, particularly around diabetes and COPD. So having those kinds of data really allows us to, to report on the status of how New Brunswick, what New Brunswickers are doing, the health service use, but also we're set up to be able to do evaluations. So if we change policy, if we try something different, we try and manage disease to prevent, say for example, exacerbation of COPD that lands someone in the hospital, then we can actually provide evidence to see if that works or not. So we've done work, uh, a fair bit of work on chronic disease around COPD, but we've also looked at things like rationalizing healthcare services. So the impacts of communities of, of closing hospitals or, or reorganizing health services. We've done some work on um, some of the more recent work on uh, the, the effects of a surgeon, a surgeon experience on patient adverse events. So, you know, reinfection or rehospitalization. If the more surgeries that a surgeon does of a particular type are the is the incidence of those kinds of adverse events going down. So this also relates back to the idea of rationalizing or centralizing certain health services. So we do a fair bit of kind of chronic disease, um, prevention uh, analysis, prevention program evaluation, but also um, the more kind of health system stuff. So we we are independent. We are at arm's length from government. We, um, we host research, um, either our own, our own research or research from clinicians, we also get some questions from the province uh, to help them with the health system. We work with the health authorities. 
but but we have this kind of what's enshrined is we have the academic independence. So we and, and part of the planning for this was that we need that evidence might be good, but if it's not seen to be credible, then people may not accept it. So having something that's arm's length from government where we as social scientists are interested in good science and what is the data telling us and and the facts, um, then that can provide sort of more credibility um, and more believability for the work that we do. But we also broaden beyond health into edu research on education, post-secondary education, training and labor, um, re-employment plans, and also a fair bit of work on immigrant retention, uh, which is another priority for the province. It's kind of been subsumed by the, the focus on COVID lately, but it remains a challenge for New Brunswick how to retain, how to recruit and retain immigrants. So we've been using data to look at that as well. So how did you get in, how did you start your research in terms of um, developing models for COVID-19 for the province? And what is a projection model for people who might not know? Well, the, the how we got into it was that um, there wasn't much at all about what New Brunswick's trajectory was and where we might be heading. Um, so there was an increasing amount of of uh, data from other provinces, other countries, countries that had experienced the onset of COVID-19 before New Brunswick. Um, and it's been really unprecedented, the, the amount of information and the pace at which information is being made available. There are all kinds of um, you know, web portals and uh, dashboards and things, and you can get really detailed information on cases. So for example, Statistics Canada has released a publicly available data set on every case of COVID diagnosed in Canada with province and gender where it's available and age where it's available. Uh, and so there's been an unprecedented amount of, of data available. And so working, uh, we, we, we collaborate with the province, but this was uh, something that was our own initiative to say, well, there's a, we don't really, we haven't seen anything yet about what the trajectories might be for New Brunswick. Um, and so a model was really just, it's a, it's a way to predict what might happen when you don't know yet what that is. So, what we do, what we did is we look at where New Brunswick was trending based on the information we had so far. And then we looked at other countries, uh, which may have been similar in certain ways to New Brunswick. Um, and, and said, well, they, if their first case was two weeks earlier than ours, then we have two weeks more of data to see what they did. Um, and so what does that mean? So we, back in this, we, did, we finished this report, um, the, the first report we've done uh, the end of March. And we had 10 day forecasts and we had kind of max peak, like peak of the peak of the curve forecasts. And then when we finally were able to release it, we, we had to go through some preparation and translation issues um, that we actually had seven days into our 10 day forecasts. And we found that of the scenarios that we had presented kind of a worst case, Italy, best case, um, South Korea and a middle case, Denmark. And we made the case for Denmark based on our population distribution. Um, that we are actually tracking the best case. So seven days into our 10 day forecast, we are in line with the best case, which was South Korea. Now, New Brunswick is nothing like South Korea, but at least the model says, this is the, if this is the trajectory we're on so far, then this is maybe where we're heading. So, but we're continually looking at updating it. We have new information. Um, and, and so just to update the model with new information, to revise your assumptions, um, and just to continue to look forward. So the nature of every kind of model is it's, it's, it's our best, it's our informed guess based on the information we have available. Um, from the um, numbers that you've come up with and where we're charting now, what do you think were the preventative measures we took that mean we haven't gone the way of say in Italy? So it's, it's hard to disentangle exactly what the contribution was of closing schools or of sheltering in place or restrictions on, on public gatherings or meetings of 50 or meetings of 10, or now it's meetings of two. It's hard to disentangle all those effects separately. We will be able to eventually once we have a lot more data, but cumulatively what we can say is that we were, that the province was very, uh, very effective in implementing those. And we had good, really good compliance. Now, some of, a lot of it was voluntary New Brunswick sort of, Pull together and say this is what we have to do. Some of it was based on threats of fines, but it really did move us from where we what we could have been to this this good trajectory. It's only going to be after the fact where we can, when we have the data to say, well, you know what really mattered was closing schools, and what mattered less was the the distancing. 
but we're not there yet. But in, in, in total, um, it seems like our experiences um, really did get us to this point of best case. Now, part of it is other jurisdictions, part of what we're interested in, we're working on now, is that other, other jurisdictions have brought in the same kinds of measures, but they haven't seen the same, they haven't seen the same slowing of the increase, or it hasn't been, the, the rate of increase has been, hasn't been as good as we have, have seen in New Brunswick. So there's reasons for that. Um, one of them might be just, you know, in Nova Scotia, they have a lot more cases per, per capita. Maybe it's because they have Halifax, which is a larger urban area. So maybe it has to do with urbanization. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're in a smaller area, you, you just aren't physically close to as many people. You don't take public transit. You don't, you're not in those areas where there's a lot more traffic. We have fewer flights in and flights out, so fewer travelers. So um, that's that. By by looking at how we're doing and comparing our experiences to what other provinces did or other regions who have had similar measures but have had different outcomes, it actually helps us to figure out well what really did matter. So the next time we have a recurrence or the next time we have a uh, another situation with an airborne virus, that we are more informed about the measures that maybe could be more targeted. But at this point, because it was new, we didn't, the province didn't know what to do uh, in terms of specific measures because we didn't really understand much about how the virus was um, was being communicated among people. Is it, is it, is it, you know, we know it's an aerosol, is it just walking by someone, is that going to do it? So we had to have these measures and it looks like we've really made a difference. So the next question, the big challenge going forward is we, we know that we um, will be able to release restrictions but when and which kind and in what order that's the next challenge um restrictions being in terms of testing restrictions in terms of easing up on um on social distancing on return to work at what point can we reopen the schools mm -hmm. so you know it's the, all those things that have been in place that have that have forced us to work from home that our kids are at home um, everything is buying this by distance no one's flying um Retail is closed down except for essential services. Even when you go into the supermarket, you, you see that it's kind of reminds me of uh, those pictures of the old Soviet bread lines back in the communist days. You know, everything is everything is so regimented. You get one roll of toilet, one package of toilet paper. So all of those kinds of measures together, um, which ones do we ease up on first? And as part of that then has to be the testing mm -hmm. because it's not just easing up on restrictions, but it's having a plan in place that says, should there be a recurrence, then how do we deal with that? How do we manage that so that it doesn't, it doesn't turn into a cluster, it doesn't turn into a hotspot? Do you think we've done enough testing at this point to truly understand what we're up against in the province? The, so the testing has been very effective in terms of identifying people who need to isolate. And we can see that just from the outcomes of having one or two or three cases a day in the province. So that's, that's worked really well. In terms of understanding how many people have been exposed and are asymptomatic, we don't know. And that's gonna have to be a broader kind of population testing because um, the way that we are testing, and this is just, I think this is, a, this is these are restrictions born of necessity, of financial necessity or resource necessity that we have to test we have to use our tests most judiciously. So if someone is in an active infection, then they are most they are most contagious. And so in terms of protecting healthcare workers and treatment, those are the people we had to prioritize for testing. But as those as those restrictions, as we as we can like ease those and we look at testing more, then we can get more of a picture on on who's been exposed, who has immunity, um, and, and those kinds of things. Now we're not I don't think we're going to be in a position where we can population test. Um, to understand, you know, who's been exposed, who has immunity, um, if you know, to, and also, to, you know, more importantly, to ind indicate pre-symptoms if I've been exposed and so I'm contagious, and so then to engage in isolation. Although, you know, with with the rapid development of technology and testing, so you know, same day testing, then we might actually be able to get to that point. But currently, we have to be still have to be judicious about who's testing. Mm -hmm. Would, would a sampling of a community be helpful? Are there any things that you think we should be doing that we're not that would be helpful in your research? Um, well, certainly those, the question about the, the, the disease dynamics, like so how many people actually have been exposed? What are the transmission pathways 
for people can it be spread by just sitting on the same so if you if you're sitting in a restaurant and you get up and someone sits there can it be communicated that way so i think population testing at least maybe a random sample of this would help us understand more about the dynamics of the disease because we can look at um for for some for the information that we do have when someone tested positive we can see we can track to some extent who then was who was infected what their contacts were what it looked like say within postal codes or areas like that um some some countries are actually looking at that those bigger picture questions so iceland has done a random sample of testing and they found and that's the, really the only way to say at this point in time how many of us have been exposed to the point where we've we've de we've developed the virus whether or not we've been symptomatic so that's an important caveat for looking at um comparing um rates of uh, of infection across provinces or across countries that the denominator you know what you're looking at is really among those people who have been tested so until your population testing we can't say here's the incidence of the disease in the population mm -hmm. that's that's less important for managing managing the disease now it's more important for understanding the dynamics of the disease in the future when we have more time to do that uh, Dr. Tam was talking yesterday about how the outbreaks in seniors' homes have really taken the numbers for Canada up more than they thought. Um, do you have any concerns for New Brunswick in that regard? I know we haven't had a case yet, but is that something that you fear would change our numbers? Well, as, as we know, the uh, residents of nursing homes are the most susceptible, not just because of age, but because there's a lot of, comor lot of health conditions that they have. So they're particularly susceptible in terms of exposure. I think New Brunswick was was uh, was did well in terms of restrictions on um, nursing access to nursing home residents, closing it down, the measures they've taken within nursing homes to protect patients to test them. Um, it is a, it's a point of particular vulnerability in any in any region, and so being aware that it, it, that those individuals are some are, are groups that we have to be particularly vigilant to protect. And, but I think the province has done very well in protecting them. Um, but that's but that's sort of a testament to the the timeliness of the measures that they took. And we can see from other other places what happens when when you're late to that step because you've got very susceptible, vulnerable people, and you can get high death rates because one because content because infections was allowed to spread. So I think it's just it's all the more reason that we have to remain vigilant. And that's one group we know are particularly susceptible. Um, flattening the curve has obviously become a term that we are all too familiar with now. Do you see that happening in New Brunswick? Yeah, I think we've already we've already done that. When you look at um, ten days ago, um, what the trajectory could have been, um, I think we really have flattened flattened the curve to the point where we're looking at you know, a single digits of cases um, is really encouraging. We have done that. We have certainly. The, the, the resources that are available have not yet been taxed. We have not exceeded capacity. Our hospitalization rates, our ICU rates are actually quite manageable within the current system, um, which is not to say that we didn't have to put those measures in place because no one really knew at the time what was going to work. They didn't know just how much, how much exposure there had already been and that, you know, that the symptoms might manifest maybe up to 14 days later. So it's turned out that it, we've done, we've done, we have very good outcomes. Um, and then that will help us uh, think about, well, now we're in a position to think about easing those restrictions. And, but as I was saying earlier, uh, where do we start? Where would we, where we can get the, the trade-off between the most economic impact and the most, and lessening the social disruption, but still have the system in place to protect us should there be a recurrence? Because until we all, either there's a vaccine or a cure, or we have, herd immunity, then the risk of reinfection is there. So that so that opening up of different pieces of the economy and relaxing social distancing has to be accompanied by some rigorous screening and testing and tracking for the inevitably there will be outbreaks again until we have that immunity. Um, in terms of community spread and contract tracing, in what ways are you involved in looking for that and, and how complicated is it to do? I'm, I'm certainly not, as academics, we're not involved in the actual process of, of tracking. Um, we can see from other countries where, where you may have a, a more of a, uh, a tradition of a, a more sort of state involvement, state oversight, state control and tracking, um, and, and also the technology to do that. I think New Brunswick, we, we, we can't 
for, for at least two reasons. We can't do what, say, China has done, we, that we, we are a liberal democracy, but also that you know, the technology where everyone has a smartphone and it's tracking you and it actually can tell you pro if you've come in proximity to someone else, so all these apps, we're not there yet. Um, so tracing is really going to have to rely on, on, on identifying who, who has tested positive and relying on them to talk about, to identify everybody that they may have come in contact with, places they've been, and then the tracing to have to do that. So we're not at the point yet of having the technology to do that. It's certainly being used in other, other countries, but yet that also has to be kind of paired with the awareness about us as a, a liberal democracy and not a, not a more authoritarian jurisdiction. From your data research, have you noticed, are there underlying health conditions that are more prominent here in New Brunswick than elsewhere? There are. So it's, it's well known that New Brunswick ha carries a burden of chronic disease that's higher um, than most other provinces, in particular COPD, so uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this would be uh, bronchitis, emphysema and related conditions. They are specifically diseases of the lungs. So if you've already got diminished capacity because the, the COVID-19 virus attacks the lungs, if you've already got diminished capacity, then you're a particular risk. Um, other, other conditions, because it's virus, we have to rely on our immune system to, to help us get over that. If you've got a compromised immune system, then you're not gonna have the, your body's not gonna have the tools that it needs to fight the disease. So in, it's particularly in terms of chronic conditions, New Brunswick does have a higher burden of, of, of diabetes and COPD. So that's the reason for us to be um, especially concerned about the susceptibility that it should we, if we had had a situation where we had mass outbreaks that the relationship between exposure and, and hospitalization mortality would be, a, would, I think, would be worse for us than a, than a population that's younger and, and with uh, fewer of these health conditions. And then on the flip side, um, in terms of immunocompromised individuals, are you finding any data that shows that say, vaping, smoking, um, possibly excessive drinking or bad eating habits, do those play into how people do and if they do contract COVID-19? So some of the research, um, some of the most recent research does seem to point to uh, particular vulnerability for smokers and for people who vape. Um, and I, we have not engaged in any of that work ourselves, but it does make sense. Anything that is that is affecting or affecting the capacity of your lungs, um, any virus that targets the lungs, you are you're just you're not going to have the, the 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 body's not going to have the tools it can to, to fight that disease. But um, so specifically around um, behaviors to do that affect the lungs. Those are particular risk factors, but I think also just general health. So, um, and this is true, not just of our ability to fight COVID-19, but a strong body is a strong immune system. So eating well, exercise, all the things that we've been told to do, they really do matter. They really do matter for, uh, if you've got better general health, then you have better chances of, uh, should you be exposed, better chances of doing well and surviving it and, and avoiding hospitalization and intubation. Nobody wants that. Um, in terms of the data you've collected so far, what has it shown you um, just for the next pandemic that happens? What should we be looking at, whether it's 100 years from now or 10 years from now? I think it's going to point to, um, I think we're going we're gonna to be able to learn a lot about um, the measures that, that took place when you implement them. I think uh, and understanding what was more effective and what was less effective. The, the epidemiologists talk about getting down your R, which is your infection rate. If so, if I'm infected, how many people will I infect? Um, which measures are more important for that and which are less? So I think we've learned a lot from this experience and the amount of data that's out and the fact that COVID has spread so quickly is, if there's any silver lining to this, is that we've learned a lot more from this instance than maybe we did in, from MERS or SARS, um, the, the previous, um, the previous um, respiratory diseases, because this has spread so quickly and so systematically across the world. I think in terms of understanding the progression of the disease, understanding our vulnerabilities, but also really more generally rethinking how we interact socially, how we work, how we travel. So there are gonna be some um, pot pot potentially some extra benefits for the environment as well. If we're all gonna rethink the need to to have that next meeting in Toronto and fly there and back. So I think there are gonna be these broader implications. I think everyone agrees um, that post COVID is not going to look the same as pre COVID. I think the analogy there would be 
you know, pre 9-11, post 9-11, air travel has never been the same. Mm-hmm. And I think we are looking at a system change. Yeah, definitely. Um, what are your predictions? Well, have you been able to use data because everyone's so online? Has that helped in your research at all? Has that provided you with anything to look at? Um, I think, so what, what we're working on now is really just what's publicly available, but I think given, given how we're set up as a research data center, um, when we, at some point, if we get the, the data on testing and infections, we can understand it by, and by linking it to our, our own data, uh, hospital records and chron- information on chronic disease, we can learn a lot more about the progression of the disease in the province. And that will just help inform and develop better models and better preparedness for next time. And also to identify uh, concretely who are the particularly vulnerable people. Do you, and finally, do you have any concerns going forward as you look at other countries that might be having second waves? Um, what do you predict for New Brunswick and, and what would you advise people to do? I, I think given what's happened in other, certain other countries, so the, the re, re-emergence of infection in Japan, for example, um, is testament that we can't, um, we can't, it's, and this is Anthony Fauci's line, you can't, it's not a light switch flipping off and on that we we uh, that certainly reinfection is a is a is a big risk it has to be it is a big concern because we don't have herd immunity we don't have a vaccine we don't have and then the next time you know as the disease uh, as the virus mutates it's like you know the seasonal flu the seasonal flu shot this year doesn't help you for next year so i think we just need to be we need to understand a lot more about this so as we get more data we'll be able to do that for New Brunswick to also to look at how it's spread, where it's spread, what where the susceptible points are, and that's going to help inform how we move forward in terms of planning for the next one. Dr. McDonald, thank you for joining me today. I'm happy to. Thanks very much. That was Dr. Ted McDonald, Director at the New Brunswick Institute for Research, Data and Training at UNB. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO-TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.